Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I have a super exciting episode with one of my role models and mentors, um, and also one of the innovative B2B marketers, four times B2B CMO, David Carell. David, uh, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Alex. I am excited to be here. David, so um, just for the audience's background, uh, I want to kind of highlight some of the things that you've done because they're benefiting from the products uh, you've you've uh, uh, and innovations you've done as a marketer. So uh, you're now um, uh, CMO at Crunch Time and Zen Zenput previously. Uh, you were. Um, uh, CMO of Bezo, which got bought by LinkedIn, and where you kind of spearheaded and led B two B marketing solutions, and so we're like the marketer, the the marketing leader for B two B marketing. Uh, before you were the marketing leader for sales, which is Clary Sales Productivity and then you know analytics. Uh, and you and I met uh, back when uh, you were showing me how to do proper product marketing. Uh, at uh, Success Factor. So I've, I've done some of the things and then like went away and did other things. And then David, you came in a few years later and I was like, oh, that's how we're supposed to do product marketing. That's the way it's done for real. So I have nothing but um, love and admiration for your professional uh, background. And, you know, you've shared some of your nuggets with me along the way uh, in building Relate to it. And I think it would be just fantastic for our audience to get the benefit of your wisdom as well. So welcome. Oh, thanks, Alex. That bio, you've kind of said it all. I'm done. Yeah, did I, did I, like, That's and you were an entrepreneur. You were an entrepreneur as well. The story so, like, of you, my life. No, you're, yeah. you're very kind. And I've learned as much from you along the way, for sure. Uh, well, let's, let's share some of these learnings. So um, we can, we can, you know, jump around, but I think, you know, we, like the, the story of Bezo which became the foundation of LinkedIn's uh, B2B marketing suite, which now everybody, you know, we're going to distribute it, distribute this on LinkedIn. And, you know, it's going to be sort of part of the, the milieu of B2B marketing uh, distribution. That's not as much on the content, but it certainly is the, um, uh, you know, the LinkedIn itself has become the content engine as well. So let's dive into that experience you know what? You know you you were in the early days of shaping the first era of kind of B two B marketing innovation. There, you know what stayed the same and what's changed. Yeah, I mean it was. I mean the context, as you know. So you and I were together at Success Factors. I grew up. I've been in B two B marketing for over tech marketing for you know well over twenty years. Um, I was. I grew up as a product marketer, right? So as you kind of uh, alluded to. So I kind of hit that point, which a lot of us do in our marketing career journey. I was like, you know, I kind of product marketing is fun, but it wouldn't it be fun to pull all the levers? And I started to get confident, say, hey, I can do this. And I took the leap and I joined a small venture back company called Bizzo, which, as you mentioned, B2B ad tech. Um, and it was early. Like, I think when you, you take your first shot at this, you kind of you're not usually jumping and managing huge teams. I was the first marketer. Um, it was an. 18 employees at Bizzo at the time. I was the first marketer with a couple of contractors on day one and with a charter to kind of build out the marketing engine. Um, and, you know, some of the lessons and learnings I think back, but the the most critical thing, I guess, was self-awareness. Like, you know, you have imposter syndrome jumping and it's like, shit, I can't believe I convinced someone to hire me as a head of marketing. How do you do this? Right, because product, like just for those of you that, like for the, like you and I were pro former product marketers. So we, we know like, that's just, it's an important part of marketing. It's kind of, you could say the brain strategic, uh, you know, yeah. positioning part, but it's, it's not the only thing at all. Right. And so there are a mm -hmm. lot of like gaps. If you're like a great, the best okay. product marketer in the world is going to have a ton of gaps to fill. So uh, yeah, everything around, how do you, you know, product marketing, you know, we don't have to, get back, we don't have to um, spend too much time there, but it's, you know, it's everything about messaging and narrative and and product launches and, and how you're taught your story in the market, all of that stuff, which is a lot of fun and, and challenging. And you build competency in that over time. 
suddenly you're running marketing and your charter is to how do I cost effectively reach all the audiences that we're trying to get in front of. And all these programs and channels are things you build at competency and expertise in. So it's like you're going up all like a hundred different learning curves at once. So the, the first thing you do um, is a self-aware as I tried to be is you get some investment in your first headcount and you build around your gaps. So it's straightforward, mm -hmm. but it's, it's kind of knowing where do you need help the most and bringing in great people, which I did. Um, and you, you kind of grow from there. So over my time at Biz, I went to LinkedIn, grew that for me being the lone marketing soldier, um, grew to about a team of 25 people over that four or four and a half year period. I had the SDR team, which is kind of why it got to that size um, and then acquired by LinkedIn. And then that was, came into a whole different environment. Um, I think the, the lessons I had, and I didn't go in with intention. It's just the let the, the most important lessons I've taken forward are one. Um, and it's, I think it's what made it, I think the most fun and rewarding was that you're building something from scratch with a marketing from scratch, which is a heavy lift. There's a lot of, there's no shortage of heavy lift in that. But in a way, there is no friction. There's no legacy anything. There's no bad habits. There's, so in a way, I was able to move really fast. And there was no preconception. There was no, um, there was no bunch of people within the company that thought marketing should be done a different way. So that was one that was really helpful. And I've carried that through as I've picked opportunities since, since that time. The second was sales was growing. Sa sales was also nascent. They only had three or four salespeople at the time with a sales manager. So they, they hadn't like, what happens in many companies is sales, you, you're investing tons of energy and time in, in sales and investment. Sales matures at a rapid clip. Marketing is, is dramatically underinvested. Mm. You jump into that as a marketing leader and you've got you've got your work cut out for yourself because you have this you this very well developed sales force that needs marketing help and you're not a and they need they they're like uh, like hungry for leads basically because right. it's becoming leads very inefficient and yeah and they're all the so, selling tools mm -hmm. so I also had the benefit of growing up together with sales we grew at mm. the same time um, I had so not only maturing the organizations in parallel investing commensurate investment. Um, we were building out processes, all the lead management processes, all of like, how are we working together? How does marketing set priorities? All of that was done in such a tight go-to-market fashion, go-to-market, one go-to-market team. Um, and I have I think that benefited me too, because it meant that, you know, all these, the cliche with, you know, walls going up between sales and marketing. I mean, it just, it's just true. It just happens really quickly. So I think being able to be dropped into that environment and and what was most paramount to everything I was doing was making sure that whatever I was doing was tied to what sales was trying to accomplish. Um, the other major, I think, insight well, I talk about, I had I had a few bets to place in hiring early on. So it was certainly around my own competency gaps at the time. But I also had a sense, maybe it's the product marketer in me, but where I invested really heavily and it paid off. And it, I think it's how we differentiated really quickly in the market. Um, it was building an internal competency around content and messaging mm -hmm. and brand. So it probably went counter to where maybe others would have invested. But the first person I hired was a really good, she was good at a lot of things, but she was a tremendous writer, right? Can mm. create really substantial content. I didn't want to have to outsource that to an agency. I really wanted that competency because I Inherently, I knew when I started spending money, like started spending a dollar to advertise on Google or LinkedIn or went to our first trade show, the effectiveness of those things of that dollar was going to be a total, would be a function of the content I'm putting into it, right? Mm. What am I trying to say through these channels? Yeah. So what you're and saying is, you know, basically there's oftentimes a desire to like grow, grow, grow leads, 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 you know, capture, capture, capture. But if you don't have substance at it's the end of that span, yeah. you know, you're basically, you know, missing the opportunity or, or if there's not like, let's say, forget even a substance, it's, a, it's at least the perception of substance, right? Like there's like, you know, let, like maybe people don't even get, get in, but you're just leaving a bad first impression and be, be just from the perception of whatever is coming after that. Totally. Totally. I mean, it is, you know, 
perception is kind of the stage gate. Yes, I want to perceive there's just credibility there and authenticity yeah. and value, you know, to earn the right. To then the unlock day, that further, need, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I want to be authentic. Um, the second design, so the second hire was a, a, and a great graphic designer who also was doing web design and all that, which is also something that seems easy to outsource. And it, it, it is, you could outsource it, but I wanted to build that internal competency again, to your point about perception, they're not going to look how you package up your content and how you package your message and, and how your brand looks. If that can break through the noise, if you're starting to spend money on a set of uh, a marketing mix, um, these are going to differentiators that can break through. So that was it's something and you were I selling think. to marketers, right? Like you were so this yes. so At so basically time, what so. you're saying, like, hey, if I'm selling to marketers, I can't have you know crappy marketing design, <laughs> you know, like and effectively, so you had to get yeah, a I good think... copy and a good marketing designer to pass that credibility bar, which is probably higher than if you're selling to lawyers or well, lawyers, I don't know, but like accountants or some other field that is not as um message savvy for sure I, I think i think there's validity in that that i think because of the audience there was a higher bar because i was selling you know into a horizontal like b2b marketing like i could sell to any 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 vertical that's trying to reach a business audience that's like a big that's a big market um that means there's a lot of a lot of noise in that kind of a market versus if you're selling to lawyers in a small like yeah maybe it's easier to break through that noise in that smaller vertical, right? Right, because you're focused, because you're, the focus allows you to concentrate here. You, you're you in, 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 in a large swimming pool. Uh, right. Okay, got it. Um, last thing I could say about, uh, so we talk about ancient history a little bit with Bizzo LinkedIn. Um, I think it was around tech. Like, I, I feel really fortunate. It was 2010. So this was a renaissance was like happening with marketing automation was just coming online. Like, you had Marketo and Elica were kind of in the late 2000s. The earliest adopters were kind of using them, but it was starting to really hit, not mainstream yet, as well as webinar platforms, as well as content management systems, like more ways to more nimbly manage your websites and optimize your websites really quickly. All this stuff was happening. You had um, things like content management, con content marketing itself was kind of starting to come mm -hmm. age as a thing. Um, even though it's a hot, it's hot today, ABM, guess what, everyone, ABM existed for a long time, which for is called different time, things. Right. That was coming of age. How do you align weighted marketing and sales efforts around the accounts you care about most, which is ABM? Um, funnel optimization, just like the data-driven, like applying math to kind of all of this stuff that you're doing to try to get the results you want. All of this was kind of starting to take shape in different practices. So I was able to kind of get thrown in that. Um, and I would say a lot of the technology supporting that um, it benefited me a lot. I think it also created a lot of black eyes because I didn't know a lot. So I, you're eager and excited and probably adopted more or tried to take on more tech than my team could support. Mm -hmm. A lot of lessons around like taking on only what you can really operationalize within the team. Right. Um, but again, that was... That was a, um, you know, an exciting time, but also it was about to lead to, I think, if you fast forward, even by the time I joined LinkedIn and those post years, all of these tools I mentioned started to become hit the mainstream. Yeah. Um, and their effectiveness, I think, over time, fast forward has really diminished because everyone's using them in a pretty, I'd say, maybe not so sophisticated mm -hmm. a fashion. Um, people are, even on content marketing, every team worth their salt can create some a blog post ebook yeah, yeah. everyone can take that yeah. ebook and spend a few dollars on it share it on linkedin so there's a lot of noise and you for us as a marketer as a or as a go to marketing team you gotta you gotta raise our bar to stay ahead of this this mainstream pack got it well you mentioned uh eloqua so uh founder and ceo of eloqua uh was on the show and and he, he one of my funnier uh moments was him he said something along the lines of you know, we marketers, we tend to ruin every party we get invited to because we just overdo it, right? Like, and we kind yeah. of have something is working and it's it's a tactics-driven world and tactics have a lifetime. 
Um, and we just, you know, tend to, you know, yeah. something's working you all in, right? Like, where's it, you know, if, if you think in farming, you know, there's this sort of, sometimes you let the field rest you know, for a little bit, you're going to just going to have a slightly more long-term thing. No. <laughs> um, Very true. The, yeah. the reason we got the, the, the fluffy ebook, the think about the gift, there's whole trend around gift cards and like, Hey, let me buy you a coffee. Like these things that kind of worked really well for like a minute. And then we just like the whole, everyone jumps at it and uses it in a way that's not very uh, useful. Yeah. So, so be before we kind of dive into the kind of the, from then to now, like, I think for a lot of people, it would be interesting, like the, you know, what drove the acquisition by LinkedIn of, of Bezo and like, what was, you know, what was it like to be there in the early days of shaping LinkedIn's B2B strategy and, and marketing itself? Yeah, I mean, I think LinkedIn, I mean, I, I obviously, I being the, being the acquiree, not the acquirer, there were, you know, I, there were uh, many others at LinkedIn, at the executive team that were made those decisions. I think what it was marketing, we became part of the marketing solutions business, which was really starting to become really strong at that time. They had just, I think, probably in the at that time, maybe a year or two before launched sponsored content. So the feed, you know, in the LinkedIn feed and being mm -hmm. able to sponsor content and where, where companies, B2B marketers can play in that. Um, so I think they saw marketing solutions as a really uh, uh, attractive business that could scale. Um, and Bizzo just had like it, it, it was a really good fit. It gave them some other products that mm -hmm. we could bundle in the portfolio in the marketing solutions portfolio and had certain competencies from a product perspective and even organizational perspective that we kind of brought to that marketing solutions uh, business unit. Got it. So yeah. now let's fast forward and you know, you like Clary again is a great, great story. Kind of another, uh, you know, we can come back that so some lessons there, but let's fast forward to your current role. Right. And, you know, you already mentioned that, you know, people, we tend to overuse, overuse the tools. Um, some of the tools, you know, frankly have not changed that much. Like I don't think Marketo has tremendously transformed or Aliqua has tremendously transformed since those early days. And then, but, but the usage of them um, is heavy, right? So guide us a little bit of what you're seeing now, you know, was, was the experience, um, sure. you know, in, in a couple other CMR roles. Yeah. I, so yeah, in this current, my current journey, it, it's kind of a combined six year journey. I, as you mentioned, I joined Zenput, which is in restaurant tech. Um, so I did where I was more of a horizontal back in Bizzo days. Here I am in a, um, a vertical, right? It's a big, big vertical, but it's, it allows me as a marketer, like we're talking to a more specific audience and have purpose built tech products to, to address, um, uh, the needs of, for us, it's usually multi-unit restaurants. It's a rest a emerging fast growing restaurant chain or a large global restaurant chain. Um, to give you the folks mm -hmm. listening here, kind of a picture of it. Um, with you know my enthusiasm, I kind of talk about why. And I by the way, just to blast it on track to two hundred million AR pretty soon. You know, past a hundred. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Zenput. So Zenput was acquired. So my four-year journey at Zenput. So uh, I'll start with the punchline, and I, I can work back. But we were acquired by Crunch Time. So I'm actually CMO of Crunch Time, um, and that acquisition happened almost two years ago. And Crunch Time did. We just. It, it's a company that's been around. It's one of the larger player tech players in this in this space. Um, and the company passed the you know exciting milestone earlier this year, crossing 100 million revenue. Yes, so we crossed 100 million, which means of course we're on the way to 200 million, right? Well, and and by the way, and just kind of for, for audience, like how many, how often do you hear that the acquired company CMO becomes the CMO of uh, of the you know the 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 larger entity? So that's kind of a sign you know, of, uh, why I'm talking to you, Dave, and <laughs> we're here I mean, to learn. <laughs> it was a great, it's been a fantastic six years just from a like career perspective because I had it again, the cliff notes, I went back into Zenput. It was almost the same situation. It was like a $2 million ARR company. Um, I was 
not the first marketer, but I had like two marketers when I joined very young early sales team as well. Um, so I kind of had a chance to go build this machine again with a little, with a little bit more resource to go on over the four years, the company grew to about 150 people. My team grew to maybe 12, 15 people. Um, but now I find myself in crunch time in this very scaled, like where we've you know, a, a ranging product portfolio, we're a global business. We have a pretty significant international business. Um, so now being able to lead, lead marketing in a go-to-market that's much more complex is given. So I've had a chance to go from, again, that early startup thing to back to say, well, how do you scale this thing? Right. Right. Um, so you're, you're asking about the context, like what, what is you drop yourself into the situation now? I think things have changed a lot, mm. a lot. Like I think all of these, it, you talk about technology, all of these technologies have gone mainstream. You can hire any venture backed company can hire some junior people and put them through a certification on some of these tools and you can be up and running and moving. So in a way it's been great. It's actually been the call it the democratization of a lot of these tools is has been profound because you don't need to hire someone who's used been doing this for 15 or 20 years you can get going pretty fast the problem is it's created a lot of noise and a lot of unsophistication and to your joke about your the ceo of eloquist saying hey the mar give a marketer these toys and we kind of overdo it i think we've overdone it um um i think prospects are largely numb to a lot of the tricks these old tricks that we've been playing with here um you know the you know the four-step nurture campaign with the ebook and the gift card all, all it is are, are the end of the day our prospects are getting you know our inboxes are filled with 98 percent of the stuff this stuff is not targeted for us so we just kind of turn off um so i think as i as i approach the role like trying to be um you know, look in the mirror of like, what are we dealing with here? Is that the, um, it still comes down to like, get really good. Like put, it sounds trite, but it is. I have this conversation with my team all the time in our planning. Like, are we, are we getting the right message in front of the right audience at the right time? How are we doing that? And I think it's even with campaigns, think about, think about what most marketing teams are trying to do in a campaign you're trying to get people to fill out a form like that's a really low bar can i get you to fill out a form a medium bar is can i get you to actually re fill out the form or maybe there's no form kill the form right but can i get you to read what i put out of the market that's a medium mm. bar that's pretty good if i can get you to take time out of your busy day to read that's that's a higher bar i'm aiming higher in terms of what i'm endeavoring to do the highest of bars can I change the way you think about something, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever whatever the idea, the notion of the topic, can I get you to start thinking differently? So our, going back to like, what are our- all, Hey, I'm gonna challenge you. I'm gonna challenge you on this one. Yeah. I, I think the highest of bars, can I, can I change the way you think? And can I inspire a behavioral change as a result of that, right? Like, okay, let me- book market to come back to it for sure. Or let me book the meeting right at the moment of the most interest on the topic of the most interest, you know, or let me kind of drill into this particular evidence uh, further the way, you know, Wikipedia does magically for us, right? Like we kind of can go drill in and drill in, right? Like for some reason, B2B content, you know, once you get something, you can't really go deeper into it into that kind of in a safe environment like we can come back to that so i would just yeah. say like to me that the the challenge, challenge accepted challenge you're, accepted no no you're totally right that that if we were kind of laddering up like you're right that's the next step it's like nodding i've 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 profoundly changed your thinking to the point that i'm like you have you're prioritizing like your, your day differently you're going to take actions differently right yeah and I would say, let's, if we go back to the low bar, which is fill out the form, you just kind of triggered a, a thought and I, 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 I want to take, get your take on it. Like kind of, so some very clever marketer somewhere, you know, at a, I think Uber flip came up with it or somebody else like that came up with it and said, oh, we're going to help you get to fill out more forms on, on the thing. The way we're going to do it is we're going to make it look like you just have to put in your email. 
which is easy, right? Like it looks like it's a low bar. And then the moment you fill out your email, um, we're gonna the form is gonna drop down further, and there's gonna be a huge form right after that where you have to put in your zip code, your mother's maiden name, your social security, whatever. Right? Obviously, you're you. Know, this is just, and to me, it's interesting, right? Because it's if, oh, so clever, right? Like we are so clever because we're reducing this friction. And we're making a, you know, you're making a small commitment by filling in your email. And then, you know, well, once you make a small commitment, we expand the commitment. This is like Cialdini, you know, Wharton, Wharton 101 marketing classes, right? Like that we were studying um, that kind of is a tactic, but it's a tactic that, you know, for somebody who's sophisticated person in the back of their mind, they're going, Oh, what a fucking douchebag! Pardon my French, right? Like the like this is douchebaggery, right? This is just you trick me by making it look simple, but it's actually more complex, and you just destroyed a whole lot of trust with your organization, um, subconsciously maybe, or or but in the process of trying to fulfill some sort of a marketing, you know, MQL quota, and this is like this is the type of stuff. This is not even. You know, this is a tactic that seems clever, but when you take a step back, you know, what does it say about you, right? Yeah, it's it's like what's what's the long term impact? Yeah. Like, right? I I think we've all experienced that in consumer world where we're kind of like consumer websites. We go to to buy stuff, and they they pull the same tricks on us, and we feel bad about it. You don't feel good. You feel like you thought it was going to be easy, and it's hard. You thought you're going to be able to kind of remain anonymous, and they're trying to like break that anonymity before you're ready to do that. You don't feel good. So if your brand, if you're trying to like build credibility and, and trust, I don't know, like, was it worth the... Yeah, and name me a B2B before, brand. But... Name me yeah. a B2B brand that actually has an ebook, right? Like if you have to have an ebook, you're by definition not selling a transactional widget that I would just buy right away. You're by definition need to educate people, build trust. It's you know, a long like game. It's, it's a long, long game. game. And then you're using like, these which by the way my, short-term tactics, right? Which by the way, usually, you know, enterprise you're selling, you know, expensive software or other services, like it's multiple sales cycles. You're going through a process multiple times, educating different people. It's a long game. It's not about getting that that MQL, right? So it's yeah. It's obvious, but in the, in the campaign moment where you're trying to get good results, people lose sight of it. Um, yeah, so that, that um, you know, aim, aiming higher is something mm -hmm. that I kind of bring into. And I all of us fall in the trap. You feel like, ooh, you, do you feel comfortable letting go, right, of, of getting some of these progress metrics that feel good, right? So you, you try to coach yourself. Um, the other... I think the path I was on back at Bizzo and I, I, I was fortunate, I said to build a team mm -hmm. alongside sales and that happened again here, but I, you, know, you never do it perfectly the first time around. So I've tried to be even more intentional and how do I, how do I make sure that, that the marketing and sales relationship and what we're doing. And, and so some of the things that we do shared KPIs, which I don't okay. think I had in the Bizzo days, like we do, like I, my, uh, CRO, Nikki, who's my counterpart, and she's also been on this journey um, from Zenput into Crunch Times, who worked together for a while. So we've built trust with one another. But we're we're modeling out the meetings and opportunities and pipeline we want across different segments. And we we both own those. Our teams own those together. Um, so you you don't you MQL doesn't move the needle for you. What moves the I needle have my is team tracks. We it track tracks people. it. It's an input, but it's not. But Your success not, is uh, late stage deals, right? Uh, you know, or I'm not going into the exec yeah. team meetings or my board meeting and saying, "Oh my God, look at all the MQLs we." Like, I don't even. Yeah. I don't share these things. They don't really yeah. matter, yeah. right? Mm. They matter to my team, so you can understand trending and progress. Um, you know, investing in time to connect, right? Like making sure you're investing. Don't keep bumping one on ones. These important one on ones, not only with me and and CRO, but a, my managers and my team, her managers in this remote world, like investing time to flot, like every quarterly business review, like if I'm at almost every QBR and if I'm not there, like a good short portion of my team is flying to be there with sales at their, 
their QBRs so that you're part of the team and you're also really front and center with the challenges that they're having. And you, you're not just off as a marketing team in some ivory tower creating all this fun stuff and thinking you're being helpful. Um, and probably the most important thing, I think this is probably where almost every sales and marketing team, I think just this is where they go off the rails and see, and I think mm. CEOs are um, maybe don't have enough context to guide this the right way, but it's around uh, we're created, we've created, I think a really strong culture of shared credit. It's about attribution and it's this old, like, was that a marketing leader or a sales lead? Just to kind of make it right, down. Right, right, right. Who, who helped get that? Was it sales or marketing? And, and I, I, I say this in like every conversation I'm in, um, marketing, the history of the world, marketing has never gotten a meeting. In the history of the world, marketing has never created an opportunity. We're making it as easy as possible for sales to do that. And in B2B, we just talked about most, unless you're like small business. Yeah, and like let's just level set, right? Like what's the average deal size, you know, we have ballpark? Three, yeah. We have mid market. We, we actually have three separate sales teams. So mm -hmm. mid market, commercial and enterprise. So enterprise could be up into the seven figures, right? And, okay. Um, eight, seven figures. And then the lower end. And the, the low end would be like, let's say it, it could be 15, 20, 25 K could be. So it's still a considered decision. People are not going to go and it's not, it's you not know, going buy that on a credit card, card, you know, without talking to somebody. So in this context, right? Like you're absolutely right. In this mid to enterprise context, it's a team right. sport, right? It's, it's a, a team, team sport. It was in marketing. And we can come back. That's one of your quotes that I really love. And I want to hear more about that because it feels like marketing itself is a bunch of different disciplines, right? And how do you align them? Yeah. Uh, but I think what what's even more important, like actually this idea of marketers joining QBRs, I don't think I've done that when I was running sales ops thing. I don't think the marketers certainly weren't you know, maybe like it was opportunistic, but it wasn't uh, a core requirement. So I think this is a fantastic you're either, idea. You're either a part of a go-to-market team or you're not. And I think if yeah. you're not invested in, in, in staying really close to kind of what's going on and the yeah. opportunities, it's really hard to do your job as a marketer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just as, you know, I'm, my CRO keeps the sales team honest. So the same way I'm like, hey, marketers, like that's not yeah. us. Like we're helping, but it's the sales team. In the history of the world, in this considered highly considered long sales process uh, or long buy process, there's almost no opportunity probably that was created without some touch by marketing, right? So it's it goes both ways. So then helping the CEO and the board also have that mindset so they're not coming and teeing up a topic and say, oh, we're going to spend the next two hours trying to understand like, where sales has gotten credit, where marketing has gotten credit, um, which is a super counterproductive and, and creates um, is a culture killer, I think, and in, in make distrust growing and thinking that someone's stealing credit, all that kind of stuff. All this kumbaya stuff doesn't mean that like it's really important to understand like where's performance coming from. Should I hire another SDR that's doing a mostly outbound calling? Should I invest in another event? Right. Like you kind of need to know, but that ultimately though, that all the stuff is working in tandem. So it's sort of, you need to be analytical, but the, the and, and tr like and sufficiently, you know, sophisticated about where there is rapidly moving water inside, you know, go to market. Yep. But, but I think you have to take out the ego. And I think this is one of, you know your master traits right i think humility it does help where you you kind of are able to you know build that culture where it's not about you know me 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 like we got this right or here look at all these leads you know look at like how cool we are and i, I what i'm get hearing from you it's this mindset is everybody's in marketing and everybody's in sales right like and or you know probably even you know, if, if there's a retention component that's very significant, everybody's in customer success is probably a third pillar yeah. that come yeah. to this, right? And obviously people have their focus, but they, they, you kind of need to to have that mindset that we're all, you know, every a, a great uh, a great customer uh, that's onboarded and successful and, you know, 
in your niche industry, right? That's a that's a huge gross and upsell opportunity. That's another marketing story you could sell and so on, right? I, I think you just, I mean, marketers, there's a lot of pride in, in, in a marketer and the companies you've built up and you know how there's a lot of pride in being a sales professional that has accomplished a lot. So I think not to dilute or water down like the specialization that has been built up, but you're all part of one team and that's how you yeah. kind of see. And it just, it sounds like, again, a little trite, but it, in practice, I've just seen like, it makes, it makes all the difference in terms of how our teams are working together and sharing data and information and supporting one another. Um, so I'll give, I'll give you one more. I kind of go back to like, how do you get ourselves out of this? Everyone's all this, everyone's using the same tactics. Yeah. Um, how do you break out of the noise? The, the one thing that we're trying to do is, and it's, it's hard, it seems simple, but it's really hard. I think the number one thing you can do as a sales marketing org to do better than the rest of the competitors out there that are kind of just um, making prospects numb is like audience prioritization, like mm. place. Like I just mentioned, like crunch time, we're focused on, um, yes, we're in the restaurant larger food service industry, right? Um, we sell to different segments, but there's a lot of little vertical sub verticals in there within a buy cycle. There's four or five or six personas that we're trying to influence. We have a pretty robust product line that we're all, we're trying to, can you promote everything you have at once? Not really. Right. So you have to place a bet. Like what, like I was just literally in a planning discussion um, with our sales managers last, last week. And we're planning late summer and fall. And we're like, we got to place some bets here. Is it, is, is it more important for us to influence like product A and audience B or audience uh, product X and, and product Y, whatever. And, and as a team locking arms and saying, good, that means by, by focusing, we're going to be able to build stronger messages, build deeper, more authentic, credible content. Um, and then you're going to have marketing and sales actually focused on the same audience at the same time. And that's also kind of an important part of it is like, you're, you're doing this in a really integrated fashion. Like mar it's not marketing, just creating great content. It's like making sure all that is being heavily utilized and, and repurposed for sales outreach. Right. Right. So let's, let's kind of dive into the, this repurposing, right? Because it feels uh, from, from my vantage point, it feels like, you know, not everybody, unfortunately, is as enlightened as you are in your in your CRO and the lining sales and marketing. And part of the the issue is that marketing use, in my view, marketing teams use marketing lingo, marketing tools, maybe marketing training and mindset. Sales teams have their own tools, you know, and their own you know mindset. And so, like, sales may use sales engagement thing and you know they use sales enablement tools and you know some content there marketing has maybe really relevant ebooks for um for the sales team but they're sitting somewhere on the website and you need to fill out one of those forms that you know i'm sure your forms are much better but like like you have to fill out a form to get that and so, like you know, half of your forms are like maybe like maybe sales people downloading those forms because they don't want to send the customer to that thing, uh, and so on and so on. So like this is kind of like slightly dysfunctional worldview. But um, when the content, as an example, resides in different systems, right? It's pretty hard to move that content across the journey. And in, as you very well know, in your world, right, where you have longer journeys, you have different um, decision makers, like a piece of content may actually kind of, does not just flow linearly, like, oh, all this content sits only at the top of the funnel and only when this company enters, like the funnel has roughly some kind of a flow, but the way people move through it is very irregular. Uh, and kind of bouncing back and every, you know, within the one organization, there is going to be different people that will engage with different content, even, you know, throughout the, the cycle. So long story short, that 
you know, how do we solve for that, right? Like, obviously, we're thinking about it from a technology perspective and from relate to world, we've seen that if you give one shared content experience layer, you know, where marketers put it, put it out there in a way that's really easy for salespeople to reuse it and you reduce that friction, it helps. But it also takes a mindset that the, the content doesn't stop once the ebook is still useful, you know, after it got the lead, right? If you do the yeah. right level of ebook, right? The case study is useful, you know, all the way from the top of the funnel to, you know, post, uh, you know, post customer acquisition when they're trying to make sense of how other people justified, you know, the value and got the rollout done and, you know, what was the, the, the benefits, right? So guide me on your thought process on that journey. I guess the way I think about it is, yeah, marketing we're going to, we're investing in like any given period, like in a, to create substantial content, right. And all, all the, you have a lot of, you're always repurposing content you're creating, but I'll give you like one example, just to get our head around. And it's always, always effective where we did our own um, working with an outside company, but did our own proprietary research. So we're surveying a bunch of people that were, that are, that are kind of, you know, in our ICP, if you will, right. Mm -hmm. Trying to, understand their sensibilities about different things and challenges mm -hmm. and trends mm -hmm. and you package it up in a really good report right so there's a and it's timely and it hopefully the information is relevant but marketing of course we're going to promote the hell out of it we're you know we're we're emailing our database we're posting on social we're doing all the things that marketing can do but in a way the usefulness of that research is going to be like really limited to um it's kind of like running uphill like in like in a very muddy trail because there's just so much you can do um one to many and the truth is mm -hmm. one to many you don't have the credibility that you have you know crunch time marketing sending something out is still like a vendor and it's you're not other than the, the trust we've been able to build as an organization so the power is getting that in the hands and cells um and so one is this basic accessibility. Can sales find what they need mm -hmm. at the right time and all that? And we, you know, we whether it's on our website, whether we we happen to use uh, High Spot with these types High Spot, of yeah, exactly, right portals that are that help us to house our content and make it usable. Um, but even that, even if they can find what they want, uh, what we've done in the last couple of quarters, and it's not marketing; it's like sales and our sales enablement team they see that car content is a differentiator and they see that reps can differentiate themselves to add value. But if you're just leaving it to every rep to kind of on their own, like some are really good at this stuff. Some aren't as good. It comes, doesn't come as naturally, you know, some are just sending their note and then adding links, which isn't going to be as valuable as like really mapping what they've learned through research about mm. a prospect to the content, like really thoughtful stuff. And that's where our content can like, really start to fly so we've done like we've at these qbrs i mentioned in other training sessions has been been really focused enablement on like what is best practice how would you how would you leverage this new content and we use their research as this piece as an example in the training exercise but it's it's building muscle with sales reps of how to use this and put it into play we try to make it easier whenever we launch a big piece of content we one of my my senior content marketing folks creates a sales enablement kit from that content and which I'm sure other all other great marketing teams are doing where you have you've you've taken all these excerpts out of it you've 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 made it easy for folks to post this on LinkedIn you've you've created email templates they can use to send the content here's but an infographic it, version that's not gated uh, that, all of that is stuff. easy yeah. right where it could go you try to give them all the stuff but the truth is the where the content works best is when you've you're mapping it to someone you've learned something you've really learned one on one about somebody right so marketing can't really do that but the reps can and and especially if they get some enablement about how to how to how to go about that yes yeah, so that's really interesting so one of the superpowers that we've seen is giving a this report which is very credible when it's kind of comes out like hey this is you know, i don't know the length of your report but you have 20 pages and 30 pages so it's credible 
but the relevant page, let's say it's page 39. <laughs> so, so the interesting thing is how do you uh, create the credibility, right? Of like, Hey, this, this page is really relevant to you. I don't want you to, you know, open this thing on your phone and, you know, kill your thumbs by scrolling to page 39 until you have like repetitive stress injury, right? Like, so, oh, wait, I could have an atomic sharing uh, of that page and get you in, the, in there. It would still have the context of where you are in the report, that it's a report. So if you want to go beyond that page, go more. But this sounds kind of obvious, right? Um but like most websites aren't designed to get you deep linked into the right um, part of a long form content. And certainly PDFs are completely not designed for anything like that. Uh, and so it's a, it's one of those kind of uh, duh features, but you can't do what you're describing while gaining credibility. You, what you could probably do is to kind of take a screenshot of that thing and no, try right. to hyperlink it but the, like you know uh, that's painful and that will look ugly and you'll not gain the credibility from the report uh, and they will say at the end the call to action is still going to be oh you know after the screenshot go to page 39 and then oh, oh what if you wanted to go to, what if it's three pages <laughs> what if they're right not next to each other right and this is even no, before right. ai right like where now we have ai that you could ask it questions like hey my client is X and they're interested in, you know, anything in this report that has to do with Y. And so we could literally recommend them the three pages, you know, in the report or in the library of reports, right? They, that would be relevant. So that's, you know what I mean? It's like, really, it's a good point. I think the band aid we do today, and I think most do it in the repurposing game, is we break that ebook, that research guide into like 10 blog posts which is laborious and it, but you're trying to slice it up and you post it so that the reps can now send something more specific. Right. Right. So but it's still, it's like specific ish. It's not really yeah. specific. Right. Yeah. So I see what you're doing. Um, but that, that's kind of the bandaid of trying to get it into the yeah. bite sized pieces that can be a match for a key topic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I think we, and we see this a lot in X, like where people, um, just just basically to take photos right like so it's sort of like a little photo and you know and that's equivalent of tiktok is an equivalent of a photo but just in a video form that's like really short a little bit more elaborate but my worry in this world is like that it's good like it's a starting point you want to have a thumbnail that's relevant to whoever you know to the person that's the audience but there's something lost and i'm curious at your take when when you're keeping it that shallow so there's this it feels like there's a trade-off where you, you you're like you know you're doing the report to gain the credibility that you've done your homework right and if the the the, the first perception of the report is that it's shallow you know you, you know while accessible you're kind of are maybe not maximizing that the value from that investment um so it's some sort of trade-off between is it ease of access and you know credibility it's also a trade off on like did i choose the right top like did i choose the right topic to get like i'm going to send you one thing and i think that's the one thing that will get you to like think differently right but what if i chose the wrong thing i'm kind of tempted to send you the whole ebook cuz maybe you'll find yeah. that one thing on your own right that's the extreme so it is a it's it's a that, that's kind of the double-edged sword of uh, that's double-edged sword and I, I think this is where people where I would say you know we, we all love the idea of marketing personalization but it it somehow like I think you like you said the sales team may have better ideas sometimes of what what's what to personalize but that it feels almost like the the marketing whatever the template for marketing personalization was feels a little risky the moment you get into substance, because it will be basically like, well, based on our CRM, you're going to care about this and that. And I'm like, seriously, like, do you, you know, what, do you really think your CRM and the data inside it is that smart? Because majority of the marketing messages that look personalized that I get 
you know, like, you know, you're lucky if they get your name right. Right. And, you know, and then um, here we're, we're sort of, you know, I see a world where you let the client decide, you ask them a question, right? Like we can take a conversation in multiple levels and you let them personalize their journey. Right. And like, is they're clearly there for a reason. Right. And, you know, just like with the best salespeople, right. They don't go and say, well, here's, you know, about us and here's this and here's this, right. They say, Hey, you know, people like you may have three types of things that we help them with our, you know, retail optimization strategy. Uh, do any of these sound re relevant? Right. And then they say, Oh yeah. Number two. And then they go, okay. So now you have an interesting conversation. Like, I, I wonder why can't the content do that? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that is where, I mean, I'm sure it's just that some of the stuff that you guys are doing at Relato, but with, with AI, I don't know. That's, I mean, we talk about all the shiny toys that I had back at Bizzo. I mean, we're kind of at the beginning of a new Renaissance where it's like really hard to see how it, AI and all these new tools are going to affect. But I, what you describe kind of seems to me, we're all and so far as we've all kind of started to learn and understand the power of these large language models and chat GPT and the other tools, it feels like instead of forms, you have a prompt that's starting to learn a little bit and you're offering up only as much as you'd like as a buyer, but then you're able to start to personalize pretty, you can, we can, you can use your imagination and to see how some of this, these uh, gen AI, AI can, can kind of change how all this happens. Right. Yeah, and I, I think I think what's fascinating is obviously like when we integrated that we we see some adaption for this, but I, I think what what's really important to say is like somehow people conflated Gen AI and Gen AI in general was this prompt interface, uh, yeah. thinking like that's end all be all, you know, and I'm just not envisioning like that many you know senior decision makers or even mid level decision makers going down the prompt route. But they do want some visual cues, and they want they want to know what's inside, and they want to preview, and they they appreciate other ways in which you could save them time, right? And sometimes maybe the sales reps, right, like they already know that they're just looking for like some efficiency gains, right? So it's yeah, it's so, just there's it's this so assumption hard. that everybody it's wants this AI chat as the only way to consume content, and it feels like if we've learned anything from marketing is that there is a you know, visual people, there are text people, <laughs> there are, you know, big picture first people, and then there's linear people. Right. And, and sometimes the same person is going to have different needs. How do you think about like the way you structure content for consumption? Well, I mean, it's, a, it gets, it gets back to, again, my, you know, vanilla statement of getting the right message and, and content yeah. in front of the person at the right time. Like, how do you do that? And I think it is the more you know. So I think you're right. Like, it's hard to see the tea leaves. Like, we talk about the prompt and AI. Who know? Who knows if that's? I think that can that'll end up morphing and evolving into many yeah. forms. It's not. It's not quite what we see or play with today. Um, but I think that does. I mean, here's what you want to, here's what we all want to solve for. It's like, Dave Carroll, I'm sitting on the couch at 11 o'clock at night. My wife just fell asleep or watching Netflix, something or other. And I, I shut it off because we're going to restart the show tomorrow. Right. And I open my laptop and I'm, there's someone on my team's like, Hey, I'm really interested. We should look into buying this thing, or we're trying to solve a problem. The buying process happens, me sitting on my couch at 11 o'clock at night when I have this time and headspace for it. So if I can go to some website, I don't know if I'm prompted by AI or what, what's, whatever it might be, but if I can navigate to what I want in the next 15 minutes, I might, that what might have taken a year and a half sales cycle, because I close my laptop, I go back to work. I'm not thinking about this for months and months. So that's the opportunity in terms of feeding content at the right time. It's like the guy on the couch who has time to actually think about this. Can you get that person what he wants or she wants, right? At the time. This is so yeah. fascinating. And, you know, I think, again, back to the relationship between sales and marketing, like the old school marketing would be like, hey, we got to, you know, book a meeting and and we delay the delay the demo, you know, we trade for the demo. Remember at Success Factors, process, we had a I'm thing where, yeah, to get a demo, we need you to, 
you know, uh, to give us something, you know, yeah. what, do, what do we get in return, right? And look, the different, and like, I don't want to dismiss, there are some cases where that's the right thing because the demo may be very expensive to set up and it's, it may be irrelevant if you don't understand why you're doing the demo. But the, the pro point is the more you could reduce that friction in those 15 minutes when you're, you know, you got the time between your, your go off to sleep and you got some mental bandwidth to do it, is fascinating, and I'll tell you the the insight that we get is we know um, you know a lot of our customers are signing up, uh, and you know they they are giving their emails right, they are giving their contact details and like in the sales context sometimes in marketing, and you know when we look at some of the analytics of what happens in the evenings and uh, on the weekends, it's exactly what you're describing. The senior decision makers don't have bandwidth to go. And dig into some of your, some of ours or our client stuff, maybe uh, during the work hours. Um, and so you basically need to figure out how to orchestrate a personalized buyer journey for the most important person signing off on that proposal or whatever it is that you're, do or you're doing. Right. And so like it, without any control. Yeah. And it's like, just, yeah, we all, we all want to, we all know it. We all, we all want to just educate ourselves. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. We don't, we don't actually want to go through these formal things to learn. Like if we're all in our consumer lives have been gotten really good at, at searching the web and all that it has to offer to like learn about stuff. We kind of want to do that at, at work so just how do we, and it, this this is not a new, I know I'm not saying something new and earth shattering. We've kind of known this for a decade, um, but like how can we start getting really good at like scratching that itch for the buyer that actually wants to self-educate, but where they can have what they need. They don't have to go to a formal product demo. They can see that online. It gets a little scary because there's competitive. I know everyone gets maybe nervous. Oh, what if a competitor is looking at that? So there's all these things that create friction in us allowing self-education to happen as seamlessly. But I think it's all, um, it can be tackled. It's, but it's kind of like, what do you, where are you aiming? Where are you aiming? Yeah. And, and I, I, this is, so, so I, I think the, the gap it feels like the bigger gap is in the B2B or sort of scientific universe, right? Like where there's complexity and we're just um, maybe not as well, like science is probably a little bit better because people do like, you know, we have life sciences customers and they love it. They just, you know, you provide the references to the articles and the academic magazines and publications, people dig into it. It's a major source. So I'd say science, you just, if you remove friction, people will do it in the B2B because they're motivated. They already think in terms of references in the B2B world, it feels like we're just not even like if we're copying B2C, we're not doing it well, but we shouldn't be copying B2C, right? We should be actually taking the best of the sort of substantive credibility building content and bringing it up front. And, you know, my view on what you're describing around, you know, competitive information or doing too much up front. It, it doesn't have to like the the problem with like buyer buyer centric like self self guided. This doesn't just happen up front, right? This could be you know proposal stage. The most per, the like right now like scrutiny is pretty high up there. So if you want a CFO to sign off on the proposal, and there is like some sort of documentation either from a vendor or you put something together, right? Like the they need to go and find you know, their section that they care about, right? Know that it's there, get, see the ROI, you know, and then, you know, maybe validate it somewhere around, poke around. And they, that feels like, okay, I'm not sold. I've kind of, I've made my own decisions. I'm an independent atomic, um, autonomous decision maker uh, and, or effectively have a conversation with the person trying to sell this when they're not, that person is not in the room, right? And you don't even know who might be in the room, but you could still secure it, right? Like it doesn't, you could restrict it, right? To people in the company or to specific names. So I think that dichotomy that, 
you're giving away too much without talking, you know, face to face. There's some truth to it, right? You do need to uncover the pains, but it it's not less, a... There's, there's some of that. It might be more like, I mean, good enterprise selling is around discovery and understanding. So maybe it's more it's just a hard to do. Self-education, pure self-education is hard because you, you, you need to learn. So again, back to will AI be the panacea? I don't know, but it does seem like the more you can learn through self-education, you can then tee up the right content where today it's been harder to do that. Um, and that's kind of maybe where some of the trepidation would be. It's like, I don't, I don't know where to lead you because I don't understand. Don't know you, I don't understand your problem. Right. Like, as much. And I think yeah. that's, that's a valid, a very authentic place to come from, to start from. Yeah. I, and, and I, I think the, the key question is, well, you know, a good website, right? Like, or a good, uh, you know, intro sales deck or will kind of have a, have give you a, a menu of choices where, where you could go. Right. And I think, you know, but it, it, it's probably, I think the challenge would be instead of like a table of contents mindset, which we're all in, it would be in the question mindset. You know, where do you, hey, excited you want to learn more? Where, like, where do you want to take this, right? And it doesn't have to be a singular asset or a singular landing page. It just creates these journeys. And I feel like the, the AI could be an enabler there, but actually if you're, you probably human human structuring of the problem, right? Like a marketer that understands what sales are talking to customers will will guide AI tools much better towards kind of what are the big buckets of problems that people can identify with, right? Um, sure. So anyway, this is fun to 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 re wrestle with this. I think one of the insights that I got from you know. A time that you you know you and I chatted when we were just starting out and relate to, you also kind of frame this you know the big big rock content concept and then you fill it out with with smaller smaller rocks. So and we've talked a little bit about examples where you're doing a campaign and then you kind of you know fill it out with supporting materials around that. How well like is that you know is this changing? Is is this kind of big rocks? And you know, the, around the big big events changing in the modern world, where you could create a lot of content, uh, run a lot of campaigns with all these tools, is it still the same? Like, what's your take on it? Look over the years and the the value, the the like, is this is this the right strategy in terms of content creation? At least, I'm torn. I, I think that you want. You were saying it earlier that like when you do something long form, it gives you a chance to show the create substance if you're aiming for it to be substance and not fluff. But I do think there's, you know, there's like diminishing, diminishing attention span. And like, do people, I, I have this horrible joke internally, like with my content folks or my head of product marketing and it, we all were about to launch a big new heavy content piece and we're all debating and sweating the really small stuff in it. And I, I say it and it pains me. I'm like, you do realize like how few people, and I I think even my joking, I probably believe it, how few people actually read that whole thing, right? So it says something, the fact that like there's only, you only think a few internal people are the people are going to notice the small detail in this big. So I think it 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 is a sign of the times that I think with so much out there and people being trained in the land of TikTok and Instagram and all these things that may there has maybe there's a balance you need to based on what people want to know giving them more bite-sized content but it's it's striking the balance you you were saying that screenshot of that one thing which maybe lacks substance or um doesn't build as much confidence so it's how do you how do you how balance do you yeah it's the confidence mm -hmm. in the i think it's it's almost again it's this it's fine thing where it, this is really easy to access and really easy to digest and you're not going to kind of overtax yourself unless you right. want to go in there. But by the way, this is based on interviews of 500 people just like you, you know, you know, and, and validated by X, Y, and Z like, and that little credibility source, um, it, it actually means a lot, I think to, to, 
to at least the B2B audience, right? Like, so I think it's the, the because again, everybody else can make up, you know, um, make up things. Right? I can make up things for you. In fact, it does quite a lot, right? Like, so the idea like of like, it, particularly in the world, which is low trust environment, the credibility, contextual credibility, I think is going to be the name of the game. Uh, at least for this type of content, right? Um, and it comes, I'll give you, a, what is a big, I'll, I'll try to answer directly. Like, where do I think it's going? Like, I think you can have heavy content. I think it's gonna be very effective if you've, if you've placed the bet on an audience. Like, don't try to have that heavy content that you're trying to like send out to the whole market to kind of right, collect right. all the leads and the MQLs because you place a bet and if you build out deep content for like, and you know it, Alex, this is for you, like given who you are and your role and what you're trying to accomplish, people can viscerally, when that's being marketed to you, um, you viscerally kind of know, oh, this thing is for me. Of course I want that. And by the way, I might actually read that thing end to end if it's actually like. It's for me and it's relevant, me, right? Someone has actually taken a lot yeah. of time understanding this is for me to create yeah. that. I don't think we do a lot of the content, I mean, even our you know, our team is probably guilty of it for sure. You, you're um, a lot of the content probably is trying to cast too wide a net to too many yeah. audiences. So, so this has been fun to riff on on the content, on the tools, and evolution of the tools. Um, you know, we we started touching a little bit on the future. Um, Dave, I think one of the things I love about you and your just approach is just kind of measured, patient, but persistent and very kind of, you know, empathy driven approach to customers, to your team. And, you know, it sounds like your partners across the organizations, you know, where, do, you know, if this is the characteristic of a world-class CMO, right? Like that, like you are like, how, how did you acquire this? Is this sort of intrinsic part of just growing up, David, is this something that you worked at developing? The skills. I mean, we we obviously talk about like the technical to toolkit of becoming a CMO, um, but like, what makes you effective in your roles, um, so that you know when when you know company that where your CMO gets acquired, you become the CMO of the acquirer, and you same thing happened with LinkedIn. You kind of you were you you know you were acquired for for the the expertise that you guys brought on, and then you 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 know led a part of the organization there. You're advising people. Kind of where do you what's behind your professional success story? That's a big it's a big question. I think I have to do some soul searching. Yeah. Um I think no place better than authentic conversations but right. experienced focused leaders. Unlock your soul. Well, I honestly I, I think I think it's just bringing like knowing who you are. Like I we all have our strengths and we have things that like we know others are much better at, right? Um, or that there's things that are really important in my role that I've had to get better at over time, right? Um, you know, for for example, like suddenly you're in a head of marketing role and you're having to speak in front of people often or more often internally and externally. And I had never had practice at that and it wasn't something that came naturally. So I had to like really, I think that's one of the things that's not natural that I've had to get better at, right? Mm. That's not... I didn't bring that into the role. I think who my personality is and what I am naturally with my wife and my kids and my family like that, I very naturally bring that into my business life. So I think that, and you start to see how people respond to who you are. You try to be your authentic self in your role. I mean, that is how you're going to succeed in any role. So leaning, leaning, allowing, just being who I am. I think um, I've, I always make it like my number one, with, with my team, others in the company, I I don't want them to see me as someone in a hierarchy. Like I'm just Dave, right? And I don't try to pretend to be anything other than who I am. I think there's dividends that pay off when you bring that to your role. So I don't know if that's directly answering when you talk about bringing empathy, it's just, just being human, bring me, right? It, it, se it seems like a good recipe uh, for, for a congruent life. And- <laughs> And, and whatever you're trying to do, good, good yeah. <laughs> uh, tips for our kids, you know, just be you. Just be yeah. You. yeah. <laughs> has there has like to be a better human? Um, 
you know, and this is kind of the, the, the last kind of question for, for our guests, like, you know, to be a better human or to be a better professional, has there been some books, some, some individuals that you follow or kind of just get these nuggets of wisdom and inspiration from, whether it's in kind of filling in professional gaps or saying, Hey, I need to develop in this area. And, you know, this looks like a person I could learn from. Yeah. I think it's more, I mean, I'm sure I've read, you know, I've read good books and podcasts and over the time I honestly, most of um, most of the real nuggets are probably like observing managers that I've had um, other mentors that I've had through my life and other um, other peers, like folks that were on the same journey with me, like starting out as heads of marketers kind of at the same time. I think you having, because those are the people that you can um, I've probably been call it most vulnerable with just like mm. really worried about X, like, because, because I've been able to kind of just be open and like vulnerable around what's on my mind and what I'm worried about, I've gotten the best, most authentic, most impactful feedback, which has been always, I think, made the most different. It's like certainly reading and podcasts and all that certainly helps. And always, I always pick up an idea on when I'm, when I'm listening. Right. But, so you're saying vulnerability is, and opening up also opens up to your own learning better the, the better feedback and it because you being opening up there's a lot more at stake for you it sticks this is a great and actually not something i expected but it makes a ton of sense like it's like it's an it's one of those unconventional thoughts yeah, that's so what you want, learn from when you open up that's when you learn the most and build you know around you build as you're going navigating your career like i think it's just more Yes, be be voracious learner and reader and all that, but almost most important to like build a circle of people that you can be really open with about what's troubling you, what you're worried about, where you're feeling lack of confidence so that you can like grow. And usually the insights you're getting are because you have a self-awareness of yourself that's very different how other people perceive you. So there's just so much illumination when you can have that conversation and kind of over time. Well, that's genius. What a great way to wrap up a fantastic episode. My to-do list next time you and I connect as I'm coming in really vulnerable, really big, because <laughs> I, have a box I love Kleenex. learning from you. <laughs> You're going to have a box of Kleenex. It'll be good. We're These good leads. I'm getting Glenn Gary oh, leads. <laughs> um, David, so good to connect uh, in this and share um, some of the reasons why I love chatting with you, with our audience. Thank you for joining us. How Thank can people you. find Thanks, you Alex. and connect with you and you know learn from you? Thank you. I uh, really, really appreciated the uh, the chat. It was fun. Thanks.